and today we are going to talk about capital budgeting, how businesses decide what investment projects they are going to undertake. Let's jump in. The capital budgeting decision process has three basic steps. First, we have to come up with some investment ideas, projects A, B, and C. You know, that might be expanding our own plant, launching a new product line, expanding into a new market area, acquiring a, another company, so on and so on and so forth. Review, analyze, select from the proposals that have been granted. Of course, we're trying to find the one that's going to make us the most money, and that's going to increase the value of our firm the most and lead to the biggest increase in equity values. Implement and monitor the proposals that have been selected. Of course, you have to make sure they're performing as predicted, and that's going to be one of the biggest problems in finance, going from the prediction to the actual performance. And note that this says here that managers separate investment and financing decisions. In terms of what projects we're going to undertake, that's the investment decision. Then how we're going to pay for them, how we're going to finance them, that's the financing decision. Because the investment opportunity stands or falls on its own, regardless of how you choose to pay for it. There are many capital budgeting decision techniques out there, but we're only going to look at uh, three of the biggest ones in this course. And those are the payback period. Most commonly used, most simple, but also kind of not too sophisticated and it has some drawbacks. Net present value, this is the probably most commonly used one, uh, the most financially sensible one, but also difficult to realistically calculate and somewhat difficult for the uninitiated in finance to understand. And then finally, the internal rate of return. It's actually a complementary concept to net present value, so they kind of go hand in hand. And this allows us to convert the net present value concept into a rate of return concept, which more people can intuitively understand. So whenever we use net present value, we're probably going to calculate internal rate of return right there along with it. So here's what the capital budgeting process should involve. First off, we want to account for the time value of money. We want to account for the fact that present values are less than future values due to discounting. And future values are higher than present values due to compounding. Because when we think about time value, how do we accomplish that? Of course, using present value calculations, discounted cash flow. Accounting for risk. We're going to factor risk in by the choice of the discount rate, R, in our present value calculation. Higher R for more risk, lower R for less risk. Focus on cash flow. So we estimate the incremental cash flows, which means period by period. And those will be involve both inflows, the money that the project generates, and the outflows, the money that we have to spend to create the project or uh, build the project. Rank competing projects appropriately. We'll rank them in order of either net present value or internal rate of return. And then utilize that information to make sound investment decisions that maximize wealth. And we'll start off with an example. And I got this out of a, a different textbook, but uh, the same kind of materials covered in the textbook I've assigned. Uh, we have a company here, Global Wireless, worldwide provider of wireless telephones. And they're contemplating a major expansion of their network in two different regions, Western Europe, and or the southeast US. So here's the projection of cash flows in millions for the Western Europe expansion. It's going to cost 250 million. You know, they have to build more infrastructure, put up more towers and that kind of thing, but run more wires. But then they're contemplating that that's going to get them more subscribers and more customers and that's going to have a payoff trend that uh, increases over time as they get more market penetration. So 35 million in the first year, then 80 million in the second, 130 in the third, 160 in the fourth, 175 in the fifth year. And we'll chart these cash flows in this fashion here. And you'll notice here in a minute, I'll jump into Excel to show how we calculate this easily. This is exactly how we'll set it up in Excel. The initial outlay and then the periodic cash flows just like this. Here's the same story for the Southeast United States. It's a much smaller project. It only requires a $50 million initial investment. And then it's going to generate smaller returns. They're also going to grow because the idea here is that, that as you get more market penetration, more market share, you get more income. But notice that only starts at 18 in the first year. And then by the fifth year, it only grows to 32 million. So a much smaller project. But depending on how these things play out, uh, one of the smaller project could actually be the better project. It just depends on what, whether it passes the tests that we're going to apply or not. So the first of those tests, or the first of our capital budgeting decision methods is the payback period. This is simply the amount of time required for the firm to recover its initial investment. And what we'll do is compare that against a benchmark. 
and we'll say if the project's payback period is less than the, the benchmark, the maximum we've decided w w that we'll accept, then we'll go ahead with the project. If not, then we'll go ahead and reject the project. The trick of payback period is determining what the proper benchmark or cutoff is. Two years, three years, five years, kind of depends on how impatient your management is, what the expectations of the board of directors and shareholders are, and, and things of that nature. So let's just presume for our global wireless example case that the payback time, the cutoff time, is 2.75 years. Uh, the Western Europe project, we have to recover the outflow of 250 million. Over the first three years, we only get 245 million back. That's right here, 35 plus 80 is 115, plus 130 is 245. So we don't get the $250 million back within three years, much less 2.75 years. So in this payback stipulation, we're going to go ahead and reject that project. The other project, the Southeast U.S. project, we have to get back a $50 million outflow. And we do indeed recover that within 2.4 years, so less than 2.75 years. Uh, the, the reason we say 2.4 years is because the, the year three cash flow is positive 25 million and we only needed, uh, we got 40 million in the first two years so we only needed 10 more million so it's 10 25ths which works out to 0.4 so we get all the money back in 2.4 years. So that is less than the cutoff or the threshold so we'll go ahead and accept that project. We're going to reject that project per this particular payback threshold and accept this one. Now, let's just look back to the total cash flows and you know the Western Europe project generates a lot of cash especially in the later years and we're just we're going to reject it because of this arbitrary 2.75 year payback period and th this project I mean this is nice but it's not generating nearly as much cash as this one and we're saying yes to this one and no to this one uh, because of the payback cutoff period well that doesn't smell right Okay, so so while the payback method is really easy, easy to understand and, and easy to demonstrate to people, it actually isn't a very good method because it's pretty arbitrary. And there's some other problems too. It doesn't account for time value of money at all. We didn't discount those future uh, payments. And you know, that really does make a difference even if we're only two, three, four years out. There, there's some discounting factors that are going to significantly reduce the present value. Doesn't account for risk because we're not uh, utilizing a discount rate, which we could adjust up or down depending on the perceived riskiness of the investment. And the biggest problem, which I've been uh, addressing, is the arbitrariness of the cutoff period. And so payback really doesn't lead to value maximizing decision. What it is is a um, a really easy and simple rule of thumb for people who, for some reason, aren't willing to engage in the more sophisticated financial analysis. Now, more sophisticated doesn't mean it's necessarily that much harder to do because you know we have Excel and Excel can do the math for us, so Excel can make things really easy. Okay, so let's find a better capital budgeting method. And one of the most widely used methods is the net present value method in PV. Net present value is the sum of the present values of all of the project's cash inflows and outflows. And as I'll show you here in a minute, Excel makes this devilishly uh, easy to calculate. When we discount, we account for time value of money, which as we've discussed is very important. And then we could adjust the discount rate we use to correctly incorporate the riskiness of the project. Remember the risk re reward trade-off. More risk, higher return, that means we, we set a higher discount rate. So we can think about that in this sense. When risk goes up, reward goes up with it, and that implies a higher discount rate. So a highly risky project, you know, we might set a discount rate something like 15 or even 20 percent, whereas with a low risk project, you know, we, we, we have a much lower benchmark. You know, treasury bonds are a risk-free investment, and they currently pay 3 percent, so a low risk project, we might factor that discount rate at something pretty low, like 5 percent. Okay? And then the nice thing about Excel is we can do sensitivity analysis and we can just uh, create multiple scenarios and, and mess around with these rates and kind of size up a whole bunch of different possible outcomes. So here's how NPV works. Simply the um, sum of the present values of all the cash flows from periods 1 through N. This uh, kind of nomenclature is familiar to us by now. The f cash flow in the first year, second year, third year, dot 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 through the nth year for however many years there are in the project. and we're also adding 
and this is to often going to be subtracting because this is uh, often the initial outlay, the initial expense. So that'll often be subtracted. And then the test will be to see whether we have a positive net present value or not. In other words, if the sum of all the future cash inflows of this project is greater than the initial cost, well, that means the project's going to generate some return for us except projects if NPV is greater than zero. That's the basic rule. Now we'll get a little bit more nuanced on that here in a minute. Okay, so here's the equation again, and we want to point out that a key input is the discount rate. Discount rate always pops up when we're discounting, when we're calculating present values. That rate represents the minimum return to the project must earn to satisfy investors. We've talked a little bit about this before, and we'll, we should talk some more about it now because we really want to understand where does this come from? Well, as I've mentioned, it, it's a judgment call. We have to decide where to set that rate based on the risk profile of the investment project. A good way to think about where that R, that uh, discount rate needs to come from, is an idea known as the opportunity cost of capital, sometimes abbreviated OCC. The idea with the opportunity cost, which you might remember from your econ classes, is this is the next best alternative we could have undertaken with our time, with our resources, with our money. So. I'm always looking at the investments I could go and just buy and hold and not have to manage, passive investments. And if I'm looking for a low risk, short term passive investment, I could just go into the bond market. I could buy treasury bonds or treasury bills. You know, with, um, with T notes right now, I can earn about 2.3% 10 year treasury notes. For treasury bonds, 30 year, I can earn, I think it's about 3% right now. Okay. And that's a sure thing on those treasury bonds. Remember what Alan Greenspan said, government can print money to pay that back. So that nominal yield is a sure thing. That's known as the risk-free rate of return. If I'm looking at an uh, investment project w within my company that's ultra safe, it's going to have to pay at least this much. And I might want to dial the rate up a little bit more just to make it worth my while, You know, to, to have a, a, a real differential in the return. Okay, so, so that would be the absolute minimum. Now, we're looking at more risky projects and, and probably more long-term projects, and especially than T-notes, and we might be looking at projects that, that go for years and years, and we're, we're thinking about maybe uh, equity markets, stock markets, and what's a good measurement of their average return? Well, the nominal average return of stocks in the U.S., for the past 100 plus years is something like 12%. So what that tells me is I can get a nominal 12% return on my money if I just go stick it into the stock market. Now that's highly volatile, you know, much higher risk, and that's why this return is higher because some years I can go down, and I could even go down for a couple years in a row sometimes, but other years the stock market is going gangbusters and you get 20 to 30% return. And in the long run, in a 10, 20, 30 year period, those ups and downs will even out and you'll get a very healthy positive double digit return. So. You're thinking about these kind of alternatives, you know, low, low risk up here. You know, that, that's kind of the floor of your low risk opportunities, your government bonds. You're thinking about high risk right here. And this uh, is probably the kind of the floor for your higher risk opportunities because when you get into more spe specific kind of investments, you want to do better than the stock market. You might, you might want to do several points better than the stock market to justify the fact that those specific investments are going to be even riskier. So this is always going to be up to the individual company to decide what is their actual opportunity cost, what is their actual threshold that they need to exceed in order for this investment to be better than other investments. What we're going for in investing and in, in financial management and capital budgeting is not just a positive rate of return. It's it's not just a positive return because anybody can get a positive return right here by just plunking money down in the in treasury bills and forgetting about it or plunking money down in broad market index mutual fund and forgetting about it. So what we need is a above opportunity cost rate of return. We might say at or at slash above opportunity cost rate of return. So with the more high risk kind of investments that businesses undertake, equity finance businesses undertake, you know, we might be looking at discount rates in the 12 to 20% range. And that sounds like fantastic rates of return. Well, and it is because uh, one thing we have to also realize is that many of these investments will fail. So if we, if we run 10 projects and two out of the 10 fail, even if they all average 15% return, 
the fact that two of them fail and maybe actually lost money, that's going to pull that average return down. So the, the riskiness justifies the higher discount rate. Remember, it's all about that risk return trade off, fundamental principle of finance. And it's you know, something we have to live by higher risk, higher return, lower risk, lower return. Okay, so let's run the NPV analysis for the global wireless uh, example case. Assuming global wireless uses an 18% discount rate, and that's in line here with uh, the kind of numbers we were just talking about. Western Europe project has an NPV of 75.3 million. There's the math. Now I'm going to show you this in Excel here uh, in just a second, so sit tight. And the Southeast US project has an NPV of 25.7 million. So which one should we do? Well, if we've got the money, we should do both of them, huh? That's always going to be the question. Do we have that much money? Can we raise that much capital? Let's jump into Excel and I'll show you. I've got this uh, global wireless situation set up here. And I just want to briefly give you a rundown of how to do NPV. It's very easy in Excel. It's actually easier than uh, valuing bonds and stocks. So I've got the uh, setup of the, let's look at the uh, project one, which was the Western Europe expansion. Our initial outlay is 250 million. I've got that as a negative. And then this is the income stream. Just copied it over from the slides. Our discount rate. And watch how easy it is to do net present value in Excel. It's a function equals NPV. You start with the rate. I'm just going to plug that in cell reference. And then you do the values that you're discounting. So these are the values, not the initial value, but the values that occur in the, into the future. So year one through year five incomes. And that gives us present value of the cash inflows of 325 million. Then I have to take that and subtract, and I'm going to add because this is a negative number, the initial outlay. So my net result, I'll highlight it here, is 75.26 million. And indeed, that agrees with what we got here in the slide. Likewise for the uh, Southeast US project, okay, I've got my rate here, so I can just run my NPV on that rate and then these cash inflow values that occur into the future. And then I'm going to combine that with the initial outlay to wind up with my net net result of 25.73 million, which is what we got right here. So should Global Wireless invest in one project or both? I've said, well, both if they've got the money. Now here's a little bit more nuanced way to think about that. Assume the firm's stock price is currently uh, trading at $40 and the discount rate that we're applying to that is 10%. That means the market's expecting a 10% return or $4 dividends. If we have a net present value greater than zero, that means the project's return is going to be greater than 10%. We can pay higher than $4 in dividends, and the stock price is going to go up accordingly with the higher dividend. Remember from last time, we talked about bonds and also dividend paying stocks. The present value is based on a discounted cash flow of the dividend stream or the, the coupon stream. So if we can bump up the dividends, the stock price will rise accordingly. And that's the goal of a lot of corporations. They want to increase shareholder wealth. On the other hand, if the net present value is less than zero, the project's return is going to be less than 10%. Now, remember, it could still be positive. This is why I emphasize the point that we're, we're not going for positive. We're going for above threshold or above opportunity cost. Because even if the return is 8%, you might think, oh, that 8%, that's nice. You know, I can only get 1% in my bank account or 3% on my treasury bonds. Well, what happens, the market's expecting 10%. And if we get 8%, we're failing. We got less than what the market was expecting. So the project's return is less than 10. The dividends go down because of that. And the stock price goes down because of that. So a uh, positive return that is not equal to or greater than our threshold uh, opportunity cost discount rate is not going to cut the mustard. So that's why that discount rate, that, that choice of discount rate is so, so important here. OK, now pros and cons of NPV. Uh, mostly pros. This book refers to NPV as the gold standard of investment decision rules. It is, it's really the go-to. It's, it's kind of the most sophisticated, uh, most informative one. It gives you the focus on uh, cash flows, which is what we care about in, in finance, not, not accounting earnings, because accounting earnings, we have to adjust those to get to cash flows, and cash flows are what we pay dividends with. Cash flows are what we pay interest with. So the cash flow focus is great. The appropriate adjustment for time value of money, because we're discounting, yeah, PV stands for present value. And then we can account for risk differences between projects by changing RR, by appropriately setting our discount rate. There are some drawbacks. 
it, it's a little harder to understand than something simple like payback period and it doesn't capture uh, managerial flexibility well uh, I, I think that's a pretty minor problem I think net present value is going to uh, work pretty well for us in any situation okay now on a closely related note to net present value is a, a concept of internal rate of return internal rate of return is simply the discount rate that results in a zero net present value for a project so the way we find the internal rate of return is we set net present value to zero and then solve for R in the discounted cash flow net present value problem. And that math would be a little tricky, wouldn't it? Yeah, it'd be some algebra. But once again, Excel can do that for us very easily. So in a minute here, I'll show you how to do this in Excel as well. The decision rule for IRR is that if IRR is greater than the cost of capital, accept the project. In other words, if the internal rate of return is above our, I like to call it a threshold, uh, some books call it a hurdle rate or opportunity cost of capital. If the IRR is greater than that, well that means we're, we're beating the market expectation and therefore that project's a win. If we're not above that, remember, yield on this investment could be positive, but if it's not positive enough, if it's not above expectations or opportunity costs, then it's a no-go. Now, an interesting way to think about net present value is to plot the change in net present value with changes in the uh, the discount rate, or the, this book refers to it as a hurdle rate. What's going on here is the, the net present value is on the vertical scale, and it's, it's getting higher as we go up, lower as we go down. In fact, it's going to be negative down here, positive up here. And then on the x-axis, we have the, the R, the discount rate. And what happens as discount rate goes up, what happens to present values? They go down, right? That's a Bocephus principle. So interest rates up, stock market's down, interest rates up, asset values down. So as interest rates rise here, present values fall. And there's going to be an interest rate where the net present value is zero. And that is the IRR. So basically the idea here, as long as the IRR is above the hurdle rate, our net present value is positive, the project increases shareholder wealth. So basically, we're going to do any project that lies in this range right here. We're going to keep doing projects up until we zero out the IRR right there. And beyond that, net present value is negative. So basically, this is a rejection re region. We're going to say no to projects that fall in here. And this is an acceptance region. We're going to say yes to projects that fall in here. And by setting net present value to zero, what we're basically doing is forcing the, the uh, IRR to this point to the kind of the cutoff point and there then we can compare the IRR to our threshold rate or our hurdle rate and kind of make an easy decision if we run our calculation we find that IRR equals on the project equals 9% when our our threshold or our hurdle rate equals 12% that would be our opportunity cost of capital by the way well then we can say oh, 9 is less than 12 so that project's a no go we run it for another project, we see that the IRR is 15% equals 15%. Compare that to the hurdle rate. Ah, that's bigger than the hurdle rate, so that's project's a net winner, so we say yes to that project. So that's how IRR works. It's, it's really a, a complement to net present value. It's not, it's not something different. So let's do the IRR analysis for the global wireless situation. Their discount rate, remember, their threshold, their hurdle rate was 18%. So we're going to establish the net present value at zero and then solve for the R and doing that I'll show you how we can run this calculation in Excel here in a second but that's gonna work out to uh, 28 percent does that look good yeah it's uh, 10 points above the IRR so that is a that's a win that is really beating the the uh, discount rate the one for the southeast US wow look at that IRR you know, we, we set the net present value to zero again solve for the R and we're gonna get a 36.7 so that one's also a winner way above the required rate. Once again, and notice that this is agreeing with net present value analysis, both of them had a positive net present value, both of them are therefore going to have an IRR that exceeds the threshold or hurdle rate, so they're both going to be a go. The question is only can we afford to run both of them? Can we come up with the capital? Okay, now let's go ahead and jump into Excel and, and work the IRR. This is very simple. I've got the same sequence of cash flows for my initial outlay, which is negative, and then my income stream year one through five. And the way we calculate IRR, uh, you want to guess what the function is? That's right, it's just equals IRR. And now the, there's a little bit of a difference between this and NPV. Here we start with the initial outlay, 
So we just insert those values from the initial outlay to the final cash flow. And it's asking for a guess here, but I think we can just uh, let it rip. Yeah, and we'll get 28%. Go back and check against the side. Yep, 27.8%. Okay, that's exactly the same. And then for the other project, Southeast US, again, just equals IRR. Plug in the values and hit enter. Let it rip, 37%. We want to be a little more precise. 36.7. So we got exactly what we got there in the slides. Excel did a uh, kind of complicated math for us very, very easily with its functions. So we'll do more of that in the homework tutorial, but that just gives you an idea. It's, it's, not, that, it's not that difficult. Just know how to set the problem up. Know what functions to use. Okay, now let's think about some pros and cons of IRR. Advantages are related to the advantages of net present value. Properly adjust for time value of money, so I like that. Uses cash flows rather than earnings. Remember, earnings, uh, you know, they, they, there's non-cash components in there. Like we're reducing that by de depreciation. So we don't like that from a finance perspective. From a finance perspective, we prefer cash flows. So that's good. Accounts for all cash flows, uh, not just the ones within a payback period. And the IRR is an intu it's intuitive. You know, we can look at that rate of return and we could kind of side by side compare that to other projects and our threshold rate and if it's larger or smaller you know it, it's obvious what that means disadvantages there's some kind of some quirky little things that happen with the, with the math sometimes you get multiple IRRs no real solution and that, that happens if you have uh, cash flows that alternate between positive and negative there's there's some timing problems where IRRs will disagree with NPV if you have heavily front or or end loaded cash flow sequences so IRR doesn't work perfectly all the time. I'll just uh, briefly address this issue of the scale problem. And this is the fact that we, we uh, actually calculated both of these. For the example company, Global Wireless, the um, IRR was higher for the Southeast US project, but the net present value was higher for the Western Europe project. Well, hmm, which one should we go with? Right? If we can only afford one project, um, should we go for the one with the higher return percentage-wise or the higher cash flow dollar-wise? Anybody got a guess there? If you guessed cash flow, you're right. Uh, this is going to create more value for the shareholders, even though the rate of return is slightly smaller. And here, we've got to be a little careful here. You know, then I think um, the, our book says, would you rather earn a 100% return on a $5 investment, which is a uh, net return of $5, or a 20% return on a $1,000 investment? Well, you can do that in your head really quick. That's 200 bucks. Yeah. So in this case, I'd rather earn 20%, even though the rate of return is lower, because the payoff is much higher. This is a negligible payoff. That's a nice payoff. So in that sense, NPV does kind of trump there if there's a, a disagreement between NPV and IRR. And what's going on there? Well, the scale of the Europe project is five times the US project. And so even though there's a higher return on the, on the US project, that scale, that much larger scale of the Europe project gives that much bigger increase in present value and net earnings. Okay, so we've looked at methods to generate and analyze uh, long-term investment proposals, payback period, net present value, and internal rate of return. And now we are ready to tackle some homework problems, uh, putting these techniques into practice in Excel. Okay, so we just went over the uh, net present value method, which uh, some of you might be familiar with from other finance classes, but we're in the context of international finance here, so we want to um, add just a little bit to the NPV method for multinational corporations engaged in foreign investment projects. So this is going to be a little bit more comprehensive and then have an adjustment factor to incorporate the prospect of taking the earnings from a foreign investment project back to the home country. Okay, so we're looking at something called the adjusted present value model, APV, which is a refinement of the NPV method. So in addition to just looking at the cash flows generated by the investment project, we have to make a few refinements here. First off, we're going to look at something known as the depreciation tax shield. So you probably recall maybe from one of your accounting or finance classes, the depreciation is a non-cash expense. We have to include depreciation to find net income, but you're actually not paying depreciation in the form of like writing a check. You're just recording it. But we're interested here strictly in cash flow. 
It's kind of the difference between finance people and accounting people. Accounting people want to know kind of overall expenses as they're incurred, whether they were paid in cash or not, just recorded in the books. Finance people really only care about cash flow. So we need to uh, adjust for the fact that depreciation was a non-tax expense. So it's not going to be included in the cash flow, but because depreciation is tax deductible, it reduced the amount of taxes we had to pay. And so we want to incorporate that into the cash flow, the tax savings based on recording depreciation expenses. So that's what we're uh, observing here. Charging depreciation reduces net income, reduces taxes payable, which is a cash expense, and hence increases the cash flow of the operation of the investment. So we're going to find the present value of the cash savings related to depreciation expenses by multiplying the tax rate times the depreciation expenses for each period and then take the present value of them by dividing them by the discount factor. In like manner, we're going to have uh, present value of the debt tax shield. So this kind of works similar to depreciation. But interest payments are a cash item. You have to uh, pay, you have to write a check to pay the interest on any debt you use to finance the investment. So those are already going to be netted out of the operating cash flows. Okay, But unlike equity, debt costs are tax deductible, meaning like with depreciation, uh, we're going to have a reduction in taxable income due to interest payments and an increase in cash flow. So we need to find the present value of that cash saving related to interest expenses. And same thing here, that's going to be the tax rate times the interest payments per period uh, discounted to present value terms. So divided by 1 plus i to the n. Okay. So those are going to be two major components we have to add to the uh, present value uh, calculation. So we address the depreciation tax shield, the debt tax shield. Finally, we're going to add the present value of any terminal value, any residual value of the investment at the end of its lifespan, which could be decades. You know, we'll have buildings and equipment and supplies left over, and they'll be able to be liquidated at some uh, value. So we'll have to find the present value of that. And then, of course, we subtract the initial cash flows. So once we've done all of these refinements, now we're ready to come to the final net overall present value of the entire investment project. So here's what the formula is going to look like. Now I know that looks pretty complicated, but just realize that each component in here kind of has its own section. So first off, we've got the operating cash flows minus the taxes we pay. So times one minus the tax rate. That's what T is. The T here, or the tau, equals the tax rate. Let's just say for the sake of argument that it's 20%. So our cash flows are net of taxes. So the tax rate is subtracted out here. So we're going to multiply those cash flows by 80%, and that's the net income. Okay, so I'm going to call this over here, this component here, cash flow net of taxes. Then we divide that by the uh, discount rate here. We're using the uh, equity-based discount rate here, and we're going to use the debt-based discount rates here. If you're interested into why as to why the book goes into some detail on that okay so this component here then this is a depreciation tax savings so tax rate times depreciation so we can call this depreciation tax savings which is a positive cash flow item so we're adding that okay and then this would be the interest payments times the tax rate so this right here would be the interest or the debt cost tax savings which again is a positive cash flow item so we're adding it Okay. TV, that's the terminal value or the residual value of the investment discounted at the equity cost of capital rate. And then finally, minus C sub zero, that would be the initial cash outlay required to finance and, and build the investment. So this would be your comprehensive present value tool for uh, working with a kind of real world complex investment project for a multinational corporation. Okay, then one more thing we'll add that's uh, particular for multinational corporations. Multinational corporation is probably interested in repatriating its earnings, meaning it's, it wants to bring those earnings home to its home country that it earned in its foreign investments. And of course, in order to do so, it's going to have to convert them to its domestic currency. So if a, a U.S. company is operating in uh, Mexico, let's say, it's earning Mexican pesos, but wants to repatriate those pesos, convert them back to U.S. dollars, 
to bring them back to you know whatever make further investments in the in the operations in the home country or pay dividends to stockholders in the home country or what have you so one more adjustment we're going to have to make in our APV model our adjusted present value model is potentially to convert each uh, discounted cash flow into home currency at the forecasted exchange rate which is called uh, S bar sub T so all we're doing here is multiplying each previous component that we discussed so here's the income net of taxes multiplied by the forecasted exchange rate and then take the present value here's the depreciation tax savings multiplied times the forecasted exchange rate and then take the present value the debt payment the interest payment um, uh, tax savings times that forecasted exchange rate taken to present value the terminal value times the forecasted exchange rate taken to present value Okay, and then a few other things to consider. We have the initial outlay here, C0, times the uh, exchange rate at the beginning of the project. That would be S0 versus ST right here. So what we're doing here is we are accounting for the initial capital cost of this foreign investment priced in domestic currency. Right here, this is uh, known as restricted funds. This is funds that are not able to be brought home from a foreign um, subsidiary but if those funds are able to be invested in a capital project they're basically they're capitalized so they contribute to the value of this investment so that the company can essentially bring those funds home by pouring them into this investment project and then reaping the net cash flows from that investment project to bring back home so if it had restricted funds that were uh, subject to capital controls but it poured them back into this investment it can capitalize them at the initial exchange rate so this would be restricted funds capitalized at the initial exchange rate and then the CL terms here the CL term here and then the LP term here this refers to the uh, benefits of having a subsidized loan from from the foreign government where the capital project is undertaken it's known as a concessionary loan, hence the CL designation there. And so this whole c component right here, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail. If you're interested, the textbook lays this out. But basically, this whole component right here would be kind of the net gain in present value terms of having that subsidized foreign loan converted to domestic currency. So once again, in terms of domestic currency with the initial value of the loan here converted at the initial ex exchange rate and then the loan payments over time converted at the forecasted future exchange rates and then discounted to present values. Okay, so yeah, that's kind of a big hairy mess in terms of um, doing a net present value process and, and finding uh, whether an investment project is worthwhile or not, but these are some of the extra considerations we have to put into place for a multinational corporation that's looking at investing overseas. So again, we'll try to make this as simple as we can, break it down step by step in our final Excel assignment, maybe do one or two of these for practice in a, in a more simple form. So we get, get, a, get the hang of this and be able to do this in a rudimentary sense. The important thing is to be aware of the differences between a domestic capital budgeting procedure and an international capital budgeting procedure so hopefully we are now and we will uh, let it rest at that and I will see you next time